Hey everyone, so welcome to chapter two. And chapter two really is about the founding of our country and really helps you understand how we got to be where we are. And in that, um, it's really important to understand what I call the unintended consequences that led to the creation of our country. Um, as a matter of fact, that's what I titled the chapter in my own way is the unintended consequences. And when I ask you, what do I mean by unintended consequences? You know, if we were in class, I would have all of you giving me answers to this. However, since we're not, you know, I will tell you in my previous classes, and I think the students are absolutely right, that it means that things that when you take things that you didn't expect to happen. So, for example, if you, an example I used to use in class was, let's say if you were going to break up with your boyfriend or girlfriend and you were trying to prepare yourself to let them down gently, you know that it's not me, it's not you, honey, it's me. You know, I'm, I'm the problem, you know, so I think it's better that we end our relationship. But in your head, you know it's really them. You just don't tell them that, right? But imagine if you told them that, that you were going to break up with them and you thought you're breaking their heart and they're like, hey, you know what? That's fine, honey. I'm glad because I got somebody else, right? You wouldn't like that so much. So you were getting an un unintended consequence or unexpected reaction to your letting them down or breaking off with them, right? Um, so the idea of something that happens that you don't expect to happen is what led to the founding of America. Um, King George did not expect for the reaction of the colonists uh, that actually happened that led to the founding of the country. So let's jump into this and take a look at the founding of America. And this chapter is a bit of a history lesson, so I hope you look forward to it. All right, here we go. So if you look at the country, how it was framed uh, around mid 1700s, you can see that the colonial powers of Europe you know, controlled a vast amount of the world. And you can see of, of America, uh, the area in the middle here in green was controlled by France. The area that's in blue was controlled by England, which was the 13 colonies along with Canada. And Mexico and the area to the west was controlled by Spain along with Florida. Uh, so basically you had three major empires that basically controlled uh, the entire uh, basically Western hemisphere, if you will. Now, the political structure in the, in the 13 colonies was very similar to England because England controlled those colonies. And it had a royal governor, and it had, it, which was the person who oversaw the, uh, the uh, colonies. And then there was a governor's counselor, council, which were basically were representatives from each of the colonies uh, that basically in, came in from each of the 13 colonies and discussed the issues that were important to, the, to those colonies. And then they had a general assembly, which were groups of basically the, the elites of the colonies that came together uh, to discuss the issues that were important to the colonists. And this is basically you know, the same construct as what was in England. And basically we were a governorate, if you will, of England. So that's why we had our own governor to inform that he basically reported to the king of England, who was King George. Okay. So the French and Indian War, uh, which started in 1754, which really was a war between France and Britain, uh, was uh, a pivotal point in, in changing the relationship between the colonists and the British Empire. The, the war lasted nine years, and at the end of the war, uh, you know, which the Brits were happy to, uh, to, uh, you know, have dealt a blow to the to the French, uh, they had what was called the Treaty of Paris, and at that time, you know, wars cost money, a lot of money, so the Brits were very heavily in debt, as also were the French or any country who goes to war is always. There's always the bill to pay afterwards. And uh, so King George had an idea. Now, remember I said the title of this chapter, Professor Epps' title of the chapter is Unintended Consequences. And so King George had a great idea. He thought, you know what? We need to put some money back in the British bank or in my royal bank. And the best way to do that is by taxing the colonists. So he has this great idea. We're going to tax them through a series of acts, and they're going to pay happily, uh, pay what we want them to pay. 
Well, there's an important point that I want to make here as we step into this, uh, what takes place over this time. Because if you could imagine, from 1615 approximately, when the first colonists got here, we're about 150 years out. Now remember, England is about almost 4,000 miles away from the continental United States. So over 150 years, people lived about 30 or 40 years on average at that time. You're talking four or five generations of people, possibly, that will have lived through that period of time. And so when you think about their relationship to England, you know, I would argue that most of the colonists who were native colonists had no sense of what it was like in England and certainly didn't have any sense of allegiance to the crown that they had never seen or had any inkling of what it meant to them. So in other words, there was no sense of nationalism or patriotism toward the crown of England because they had no sense of it because they were not born there had never seen it, never experienced life in England, the culture, the political culture. They had no framework of understanding that. Only the older people and the elites had any idea of that, and that was only in the earlier generations. So the Brits, under King George, decided to have a series of proclamations. And of course, you, the Sugar Act, the Stamp Act were the first. And of course, the colonists were extremely pissed about this. <laughs> they were repealed it in 1766 because the colonists were so upset. And the colonists got together, uh, the leaders of the colonies got together, and they had what was called the first Intercolonial Stamp Act Congress, and that happened in 1765. And at that co Congress, they wrote what was called the Declaration of Rights and Grievances. Now, one of the key issues for them was the issue of taxation without representation. And I'm sure you've heard that before in one of your classes as you were in K through 12. But the issue was, hey, how can you tax us when, you, you, when we have no, we have no say so, no rights in the, under the British crown? Uh, and just so you understand, the Declaration of Rights and Grievances was the founding document that became the Declaration of Independence. So they, the colonists, create this declaration, and the colonists start come back with their own. Uh, response by having several acts, which was the Townshend Act of 1767, the Tea Act of 1773, and the Boston Tea Party, and then which resulted in a couple of other acts. And then in 1774, they had what was called the First Continental Congress. Now, the First Continental Congress was the group of colonists, and again, these are basically the rulers and the, the elites of the, of the colonies who got together to discuss the idea of separating from England. Now, as I told you before, this really wasn't that far-fetched of an idea because they didn't have any historical tidying when over a 150-year period from the first colonists getting there to the last, to not the last, but till the middle of the, seventh, of the 18th century. Um, and so when they decide to write the Declaration of Independence, they, form the, they come together again for the Second Continental Congress, and they take the Declaration of Rights and Grievances, and now they to write the Declaration of Independence. Now, this is a real pivot point because the Declaration of Independence to the colonists was a declaration of war to King George. You could, you could just imagine King George chilling out in, in his, in his uh, castle, sitting in his fancy chair with his crown on his head, and then he gets a, you know, he gets a memo, right, that says uh, the colonists have now decided to tell you that they want their freedom and they're declaring independence from the from Britain. You know, I bet you King George had probably spun around six times, right? He's like, what? What do you mean? What? You're, you're leaving me? Like, oh, no, you're not. I'm the king and how dare you? You can imagine what King George was feeling like. I always tell people, put yourselves in the king's shoes, right? If you were the king and somebody told you they were leaving you, uh, you'd be pretty upset and probably be ready to send uh, your troops in to deal with them. And that's exactly what King George tried to do. Uh, so, of course, the Revolutionary War occurs, and the colonists win, thanks to some help from the French. And ironically, the French wanted to get a little extra help, wanted to stay for a while, but the colonists said, under George Washington, said, thank you, but no thank you. We've got this all figured out, so we're going to take care of it. The truth is, they didn't have it figured out, um, <laughs> but they certainly tried to quickly. So... What they did was that they had, they had their first convention and they decided to create what was called the Articles of Confederation. And these are basically an articles based on creating a confederal system of government, meaning they wanted to have a weak central government 
And this was really important to them because they wanted to create a type of government that would allow for the colonies, and the, which were then becoming states, to be to have more power than the central government. They didn't want to have to risk the, the rule of a monarch coming back to haunt them. So when they had their convention in Annapolis, the whole purpose was to be able to uh, set up the framework, the institutional framework of a government, so they would not have anarchy you know, take over and everybody run for their own, you know, take care of their own self-interest. So they had to unite these colonies or these states together quickly in order to, even though they had various interests of their own and some were bigger and richer and some were smaller and poorer than other states, but they had to figure out a way to unite them quickly. And this, so the Articles of Confederation were very similar to what the structure that they had coming from England because it was an easy fix for them early on to be able to sort of, uh, go back to what they knew, even without a monarch, but the structure would be very similar. But see, interesting thing happened along the way. Um, it actually led to the failure of the Articles of Confederation. See, there was a farm, series of farmers uh, that were, which basically is how they made their money uh, in the colonies. Because remember, the colonists were just as broke as England after the war, so they had their own issues to deal with regarding trying to figure out how to get on their feet, how to become financially solvent to, to develop an economic system along all those things had to happen in order to develop and become independent and sustain yourself and so uh interesting how those that have once been oppressed can become oppressed by their own people and so what happened was the state governments started to basically tax the farmers unfairly uh seize their crops and the farmers rose up and a farmer named daniel shays uh, started a rebellion, and it's called famously called Shays Rebellion. And uh, during the rebellion, several farmers, including Daniel Shays, were killed. And the important point about this was that it showed the the federal government, the central government, that the, the necessity of having a strong central government to hold the states accountable to each other, and that without that, the United States would never have sustained itself. It would have fallen apart because any state that had more power than the other one would eventually decide on its own to break away and leave the small states defenseless or with nothing to, to, to uh, politically be able to stand for. So this was the pivot point toward the necessity of change from the Articles of Confederation and moving toward a, another type of system. And that's what we see happen uh, after this peak. Okay, so you know, if we talked about the again the Articles of Confederation and basically it that's the same thing that we saw that happens actually that led to the Civil War um, and basically another 60 years later as a result or a little over 60 years later as a result of the unresolved issues of, of what took place uh, in uh, the late 1700s. So. With that, um, I'm going to pause for a moment and then I'm going to go to part two. So let me stop here for a second.